couple of uh, months ago, my family and I were able to take a private tour um, in California at the Warner Brothers uh, movie uh, set studio. And uh, these, Warner Brothers is a place where uh, they create and they film a lot of our uh, TV sitcoms. Did you know that? And uh, they even film uh, a lot of our movies that we enjoy when we go to uh, the theaters. And uh, part of the tour included uh, going in the back lot and uh, walking actually onto some of the sets that they film. Some of the uh, movies and, and uh, sitcoms that we visited was uh, uh, sitcom Friends. How many of you remember Friends? Yeah? We were able to actually sit on the couch ah, and hold their coffee cup. Yeah, that was pretty cool. And right now, they're actually, uh, they were filming uh, a Rush Hour. Yeah, they were filming uh, Rush Hour. And also, they filmed uh, Supergirl, uh, Supergirl uh, that we see on, on TV. And uh, as the guy... Uh, you know, showed us around, we were able to actually walk onto the set of Supergirl. That was pretty cool. And, uh, you know, as, as we were walking around, I, I, I just couldn't help but see all the props and all of the stuff that you see on TV. And I'm thinking, wow, I, I watched this at home and now I'm here and look at all of the props. And there were computers and, and lights and there were, uh, you know, computer keyboards. And, and so, you know me, right? I, I got to I got to touch, I got to touch all the props. And as I was playing around with the stuff, I, uh, I hear the tour guide goes, excuse me, sir, uh, please don't touch the props. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, as soon as, he's, as soon as he turned around, you know, <laughs> right? But then uh, part of the tour, he, he took us, and then we, he took us into this warehouse, this big warehouse, and there they kept all of the props the costumes, and all of that stuff from Harry Potter. Yeah, that was so cool to see the wand and all of the stuff. I'm like, wow. I never saw the movie, but wow, <laughs> you know? Uh, but the bestest part, I got to do the bam thing, the bestest part was they took us into Batman's lair. Wow. All the Batmobiles, the motorcycles, the costume, the Riddler, the Penguin, all of that was there and all had all of the Batman props. And so, you know, my, my son, he saw me looking at all the Batman props. He looks at me, he goes, Dad, don't touch. <laughs> but you know me, right? I mean, as soon as no one was looking, ooh, <laughs> wow. And then all of a sudden, I hear this Filipino worker lady go, uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, please don't touch the props. <laughs> well, fine. <laughs> right? But you know what? It taught me something. There are certain things that you can touch and certain things that you shouldn't touch. In Hawaii, the word don't is translated or turned into the word no. Yeah. So we don't say, don't touch. We say, no touch. <laughs> and in Hawaii, we always have to uh, add the word, he at the end. <laughs> so it's, no touch, eh? <laughs> right? I mean, ha is like a catch-all word in Hawaii, right? I mean, check this out. Uh, people in the mainland, they say, excuse me, uh, what did you say? In Hawaii, ha? Huh? <laughs> we cut it short. No need all the other stuff. Just ha? Huh? <laughs> you know, children, children tend to touch everything. Isn't that so true? They get their hands on just everything. And, and as parents, when we don't want our, our kids to touch something, we either put it high or we put it real far away from our children. Because why? We don't want them to, to touch it. We put it out of reach of their, their prying hands. And sometimes as God's children, sometimes God says, no touch, eh? Right? Isn't that so true? Kids, they touch anything. Hot, cold, dirty, clean, mine, yours. They don't care. They just touch everything. 
And that's why God, our Heavenly Father, sometimes in the Bible, He'll say, don't touch or no touch. So when you read through the Bible, don't be afraid or don't be surprised if you hear or read stuff like this. Touch nothing unclean. Isaiah 52, 11. In other words, in, in Hawaii, we would say, hey, no touch pilau stuff. <laughs> pilau means dirty. Okay? Or he goes on to say, do not touch my anointed ones. In Hawaii, we would, we would say something like, hey, no touch the high maka maka guys. <laughs> yeah. In the book of Job, it says this, the Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. So God even told Satan, no touch ya. <laughs> so bottom line is whether you're at Warner Brothers Studio, in, you're in Hawaii, there are going to be certain things that God says you can't touch and certain things don't touch. And sometimes we might not understand why. Why can't I touch that? But when that happens, we need to trust God that he knows what he's saying. And when he says don't touch, it's for our good. It's for our destiny. Amen? It's for our well-being. So this morning, let's focus on just a couple of things that God says don't touch. And I believe that as we learn the word of God this morning, it'll help you be blessed. It's going to help you receive more miracles in your life. So number one, don't touch forgiven sins. Don't touch forgiven sins. Whether it is yours or somebody else's, don't touch. Don't touch forgiven sins as if it is unforgiven. Sometimes I notice that when God forgives, instead of receiving his forgiveness, we receive condemnation. We condemn ourselves. We can't be, we, we, we're too quick to judge ourselves and we're qu too quick to judge other people. But what we got to realize is that when God forgives, he forgives completely. And sometimes we, we look at other people, but we don't see them that they're, they're taking a healing. They're getting healed from their sin. They're in the process of being restored. They're, being, they're walking in the process of being purified from the consequences of sin. It's the same thing with us. Sometimes we don't know that they're making things right between God and themselves. Folks, God is quick and faithful to forgive our sins. He is quick and faithful. God does not delay. He's not a procrastinator when it comes to forgiveness. And many times when we hear that, right, we say it sounds too good to be true. And we don't believe that God can forgive our sins. Plural. Because we've been taught not to believe stuff when it's too good to be true. We, we think that, that there is a cap to God's forgiveness. There is a limitation. There is a point to God's uh, forgiveness. Because it does sound too good to be true. But let me be an encouragement to you. With God, it is true. Yeah. God doesn't just forgive us up to a point. God doesn't just forgive some sins, some mistakes. No, God forgives the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yep. It says so in his word. He says, if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive what? Our sins. And purify us from all unrighteousness. Not some, but all. Isn't that good news? All. Everything. You think, not that sin. No, that too. Oh, not this one. No, that too. Yeah, he forgives all our sins. God is quick and faithful to forgive all of our sins. Scripture says it this way. He has removed our sins as far away from, from us as the east is from the west. Would you circle the three words, as far away? I love that. Listen, your sins, my sins, the world's sins are forgiven so that we can move forward. He removes our sins so that we can be released into God's purpose, His plan. Released into our dreams. Released into a, 
better life, release into our eternal life, a quality of life now as it is in heaven. There is a reason why God is quick and he is faithful. Because as soon as we ask for forgiveness, he is quick because he wants to release us that quickly. Does it make sense? Oh, man. And just like, you know, our parents, when, we, when they put something uh, far away, I don't know about you, but when I look at as far away as the east is from the west, I can't see the end of east and west. That's how far God, our Father, is removing our sin as far away. Why? Because he has an intent for us not to touch it. You see that? My dad, when there was poison in the house, he moved it far away. Why? So that I don't touch that poison. Sin is poison. And he doesn't want us. That's why he separates it far from us. And he says, don't touch it. Yeah, it's not good. And too often, believers who repent from their sins, I see this oftentimes, they remain stuck in their sin as if it was not forgiven. Yeah. They keep touching and retouching it as if it wasn't forgiven. They, they keep creeping back to it inch by inch, trying to draw closer to as far as from the east as from the west. No. See, I notice that people bring up their sins, their, their past failures and their mistakes as if it was not forgiven. Yeah, in their conversations, they speak of sin on the defeat side and not on the victory side. They keep rehearsing it in their minds. And when they keep bringing it up and they rehearse it, what's happening is they're nursing it. Whatever you rehearse, you nurse. And when you nurse it, you nurse it back to life. When God says it is quick and dead. You see that? And that's why as a believer, the good news is that once he's forgiven, it's forgotten. Don't keep rehearsing it in your mind. No. Release it. Get it out of it. Get it, get it out of your life. Don't nurse it. Whatever you touch will come back to life. Don't touch it. Do not touch it. God removed Egypt from the people of Israel. The people of Israel was delivered from the bondages and the slavery that was in Egypt. But when things got really tough for the people of Israel, some of the folks wanted to go back and touch Egypt again. They were tempted to touch the very thing that enslaved them, the very thing that kept them in bondage. That's what happens when, when your Christian walk gets tough. The tendency is to want to go back to the life that you once lived, the life that God had forgiven you of. Don't do that. The people of Israel wanted to creep back inch by inch back to where they came from. And when I read that, I thought, gee, Whitakers. These folks were willing to backtrack, right? Backtrack all the way, meet the unparted uh, sea, a Red Sea again. And you notice that sometimes temptation is so, so powerful to draw you back to a place of sin, the bondage, that people are willing to, to work hard to get, uh, you know, swim past the Red Sea and, and go back to where they came from. No, when God says, I have set you free, he has set you free indeed. Yeah, he doesn't want you to live under the weight of guilt because a, a, a law, accompanying sin with sin comes weight. Sin weighs you down. It weighs you down with guilt. It weighs you down with condemnation. It weighs you down emotionally. It weighs you down psychologically. It weighs you down like a, like a heavy baggage. No, in fact, God wants to remove the, the, even the stigma, -ta, the stigmata yeah. of that sin. The Bible says in Psalms 32, 1, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Listen, you have Jesus. If you have Jesus in your life, if you said yes to Jesus, if you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, the Bible calls you, how blessed are you? You are blessed. Isn't that good news? Folks, God doesn't just remove the sin. He covers it with the most powerful covering in the entire universe. More powerful than Teflon. More powerful than steel. 
He covers it with His love. His love is the most powerful force in the entire universe. How do I know? 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sin. And I've learned that whatever God covers, don't start reaching in and touching it. There's a reason why he's covering it. He's not covering it with condemnation. He's not covering it with disappointment. He's not covering it with, oh, you bad. No, he's covering it with his love. You see that? He didn't have to, but what's great about this love is the word agape. He says, I'm covering it because I choose to cover it. I choose not to look at the ugliness. I choose not to look at your mistakes. I choose not to look at your failures. I choose to look at my child because I love you. You see that? God loves us so much that he covers our sins. He separates it far from us. And number two, don't touch an offense from the uncommon. Don't touch an offense from the uncommon. Don't even touch somebody else's offense. Folks, need to get this deep down in your spirit. Got to get this. Offense is a killer. It is a killer. It's worse than cancer. It is worse than diabetes. It is worse than uh, high blood pressure, it is worse. Not, no church has ever broken up, split apart. No family has uh, broken up or split apart from all these other health stuff. No, you know what breaks up churches, what ch- uh, breaks up families, what breaks up uh, workers, uh, co-workers, what breaks up friends? It is offense. Offense is a killer of relationships. It is a killer of future miracles in your life. That's why the Bible warns us against touching God's anointed ones. He said, don't touch it. Don't touch them. He says, don't take offense. Now, let me give you an illustration of uh, offense so you know uh, what it is in your life and how it plays out. One time I went fishing, and um, I was doing really well at at fishing, and, and I bent down, to uh, bait my hook again. And so I was cutting some bait, and uh, this guy from far away, he came running, and he sat down right in front of me. And he, he looked at my bait, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm cutting bait. He goes, and he looked at my knife, he said, oh, can I see your knife? And so I said, okay. I just lifted my knife out, and at the same time, he reached out to grab it, and he cut himself. It wasn't a big cut, but he cut it, it drew blood. And the thing about it is, that's what offense is. Offense is like a cut. It's like a knife cutting you. See that? And the thing about it is, if when you, when you uh, are offended, you are cut on the inside. And you bleed on the inside. And if you're not careful, and you, you, you harbor offense between, you, you're offended by your wife, or you're offended by your husband, you're offended by uh, your leaders or whatever it is, you're offended by the church. And you know that some people can be even offended by God? Yeah, and I didn't mean to cut him, but he was cut. He received a cut. And the thing is, if you don't get healed from that offense, if you, if you don't release that, uh, that uh, offense, offense will, will form or be transformed or mutate in what is called resentment. And now people start resenting the church, resenting God, resenting my husband, resenting my wife, resenting my mom, resenting my dad. And resent comes from the word resento. Re means again. Sento means to feel the cut or the pain of the cut again and again and again. And that's why, folks, a lot of times when, you, when you're offended by someone, right, and you see the person and you haven't dealt with it, you see the person and you feel the cut, the pain Again and again and again and again. See that? And that's why it's important not to touch it. One time, uh, I, was at, I was fishing too, and I was doing really well. And, and uh, this guy, again, he comes close to me. I don't know why people have to come close to me when I'm fishing. 
I just don't get it. I want to be alone. You know, like, uh, make room, right? This is my shalom right here, right? But I had a, like a seven-foot seven pole. It was a kind of hefty pole. And this guy comes so close to me. And as soon as he came close, I got a hit. So what I did was I yanked, the, <laughs> I yanked it and I hit his face. That's how close he was. His glasses fell off, you know. And I was like, in, in my mind, I was thinking, good for you, stupid. <laughs> Come so close to me. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry. I wasn't wearing my New Hope shirt. <laughs> I didn't have any Christian stuff or the fishes or whatever, you know. And so you don't have to worry about that. But that's what I was thinking in my mind. You see what you get, you stupid. You come close to me. <laughs> and he had a, he had a big, like uh, in Hawaii, we call him tonkobo, right? A big uh, lump uh, and a bruise on his, on his head, right? But here's, the, here's my point. Offense can either cut or it can bruise. A cut bleeds on the outside, but a bruise bleeds on the inside. So just because you're offended and, and nobody can see, right, that doesn't mean that you weren't injured by an offense. You could be bleeding on the inside. And that's what a lot of folks carry around is the bleeding on the inside from past offenses that they received. Does it make sense? And folks, that's why offense is, is dangerous. Don't touch it. Because here's the thing. When you're offended, when you're hurt, you don't want to get close to people. That's why a lot of folks have very shallow relationships. They don't want to get into relationships in church. They don't want to get too close to other people. Not because the other person never brushed their teeth or were underarm deodorant. <laughs> it's because... They've been offended before, they've been hurt before, and hurt people put relationships at arm's length. Don't get too close to me because I don't want you to hurt me. I've been hurt before, right? And that's what the enemy uses as a tactic, tactic to divide relationships or to keep relationships not getting so close. Does that make sense? In Mark chapter 6, Jesus returns to his hometown called Nazareth. And his disciples are following him. And on the Sabbath day, he goes to uh, different churches. And he's uh, speaking and he's teaching in the church there. I want you to hear and listen and see the scene of what's happening. Because as he's teaching, the listeners or the congregation is hearing him, just like you are now. And... They start whispering or talking among themselves, and this is what they're saying. Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? Watch this. And they took offense at him. Circle the word took offense. Imagine that Jesus is in the flesh and blood. They're not reading about him. They're not hearing about him. They're actually in the same room, breathing the same air. And Jesus is speaking to them, teaching them mano a mano, in person, in the flesh and blood. And yet, the people that are listening to the Son of God, right, and they took offense at him. I don't know what he was teaching, but they took offense at him. Why? Well, here is this. What I've learned is that what this guy did when he reached out for my knife is I didn't intend to cut him. He cut himself. He took offense. And that's what a lot of times we do is someone says something, they don't intend to offend us or cut us, but we cut ourselves with it. Why? Because here it is. When the uncommon becomes common, it's easier to take an offense. It's easier to cut yourselves. Why? Because when you, here, watch this now, when you take offense, you actually touch the offense 
And when you touch the offense, you cut your own self. And what happens is this. When you take offense, you cut yourself. You not only cut yourself, you're cutting yourself off from future miracles happening in your life. See, God wants to do miracles in your life. He wants to continue to bless us. But watch this. Oh, this is so good, guys. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own hometown, among his own relatives, in his own household. What he's saying is this, that we often hear, familiarity breeds contempt. Jesus was familiar to the people. The people were familiar with Jesus. In other words, the people saw him grow up. The people saw him in his Hanabara days. Right? And uh, Jesus, as a prophet, became common in the hearts and the minds and in the perception of the people. And that's why, listen folks, that's why it's harder to receive instructions and corrections from the people that are closest to you. I've seen husbands that can't receive correction or admonishment or instructions from the wife because she's close to you. And what she says is offen offensive to you because why? That what she said, and it can be uh, ex for the wife too, right? I can't receive what my husband is saying. Why? Because of a pride thing. Because of, because of an ego. Oh, you, you bruised my ego. Oh, you cut my ego. You cut my pride. Isn't that right? And that's why, folks, you watch this now. This is the dynamic. That's why a lot of married couples can't get into a deeper relationship because they don't want to get offended. I can't speak into you because you get so touchy-feely. You, you blow up. You take offense when there's no offense given. And that's why God can't bless your marriage. God can't bless and, and do more miracles in your marriage, in your church, in your ministry. Because why? We are we're supposed to be close to one another. And that's why people, even when they come to church, they don't want to get involved. They don't want people getting too close in their life. I don't want you to find out about me. I don't want to find out about you either. Right? I don't want you to speaking in because I know I'm going to get offended by you. And so what happens is people come to church, but they have shallow relationships. They never experience deeper relationships. And that's why how we, how we uh, treat and perceive other people is the same way how we treat and, and relate to God. That's why, folks, that's why people sometimes, even as believers, we have shallow relationship with God because because God offends me. God cuts me. God bruises me. But we have to understand that it is not his, his intent to hurt us. It is, what he says is, is, is given to help us. When God takes out his scalpel, it's not to kill us. He is like the great physician who is there to scalpel so that he can hurt, uh, heal us. But he needs to cut us first. He needs to cut us so that he can get out the pride, the, the worry, the condemnation, the stress, the addiction. The, he has to get deep inside. But what we feel, you know, you don't go to the hospital and the, and the surgeon cuts us and go, I'm offended. <laughs> right? I'm out of this hospital. You offend me. Get this stuff out of me without cutting me open. Right? No, he's like the great physician. That's what God is. And sometimes God has to cut. But we cannot take offense. Watch what happens because, listen, you know, even this works in, even with kids and in our families. Our father, you know, he gives us instructions to the kids and, and correction. And he advises life lessons and he gives. And then if the child is, is uh, you know, prideful or ego or immature, I, I'm offended, my dad says. They might not say it, right? But they get cut, they get bruised. And what happens is they start distancing themselves from mom and dad. That's why there's a big gap between kids and their parents. And that's how the enemy deceives us. The enemy uses offenses to 
to separate those that's supposed to be close. I don't know about you, but man, I, I know people that when they went under the surgeon's knife, they got real close to the doctor, the surgeon who did the, who did the healing, right? And watch this. He goes on, Jesus says this, and he could do no miracles there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Would you circle this? Uh, could do no. Those three words, could do no, and circle could. The Bible doesn't say would do no. It says could. In other words, Jesus wanted to do more miracles in their life, but he could not do it. Something was preventing Jesus from from really blessing the people, from doing more miracles, something. He wanted to. Does it make sense? He could not do. There was a resistance. There was something holding him back. It's the same thing with a child. When, they, when a child takes offense at a parent, the parent wants to, I would bless you, I would do more good, but I could not do it, child, because you took what I said as an offense. You took it as a hurt and not a heel. Are you guys getting this? And that's why, folks, sometimes if we're not experiencing the, the, the abundance of life that God has or the blessing or the miracles in our life, sometimes it, it's not the other person. It's not my dad, my mom. It's not the church. It's not the leader. It's not the prophet. It's not, no, uh, could it be like, could it be, could it just be like, Could it be that you're carrying an offense that has not been healed? And the worst thing to do is get in a relationship offended because the relationship is shallow. I never knew you when we said, I do. Because there was underlying bruises there from the past. There was underlying cuts there from the past that was never healed. And I can, in this new relationship, you bleed into this new relationship that God wants to keep pure. Uh, telling you people, whenever you get cut by an offense, it's like this. You're in the water, the Pacific Ocean, right? And let's say you get a cut in the Pacific Ocean and you start feeling the trickle of the blood leaking from this cut in your arm. And I don't know about you, but I've watched Discovery Channel. You know what blood in the water attracts? You're right, shark attack on natives, man. You start hearing, do 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 you hear it, offended people? do 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 Right? Folks, the devil and his demons are like sharks. It smells blood, the spiritual blood from miles away. And when you are offended, do 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 You attract darkness you attract that's why the, that's why jesus cannot do any miracles you got to get healed you got to get healed that's why jesus is the life savior he throws himself in the water so he can pull you out see god i tell you what god wants to do so much miracles in our lives he wants to bless us but there's going to be things that you cannot touch don't touch an offense don't touch somebody else's offense. Some of us are way too easily offendable. Yeah, we need to be, when you have Jesus in your life, right? I think I, this is what I want. If I could lead a, a bunch of new people to Christ, I would say, here, this is one thing I ask you. Just one thing. One thing. And I believe if you can get this one thing in your spirit, you're going to last the long haul. Yeah, you're going you're, you're gonna to finish the race that is set before you. That you are going to receive more miracles and blessings. You're going to see God in such greater ways. You're going to experience Him in a deeper way. Your relationship is going to be so much better at church, at your job, in your, in your marriage, with friends. One thing. What's that one thing, Pastor Ken? Here it is. You want to hear it? You want to hear it? Here it is. Catch this. Be unoffendable. Be unoffendable. Nothing can... No, what you... I'm, I'm, I'm not taking offense. I'm unoffendable. Go for it. I'm un, unoffendable. 
You can't cut me, bruise me. No. See that? Why? When, you, when you're that, miracles, blessings. Does it make sense? I'm going to end with this little short story that happened just right, right here, off, off stage. Auntie Bernie comes up to me. He goes, Pastor Ken, oh, your shirt oh, makes you look so big. I told her, Auntie, I'm married already. <laughs> but I could have taken offense. What do you mean, Pastor Ken? Yeah, I could have taken offense because it's not the shirt that makes me look big. It's what's inside the shirt. The reality. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> Folks, I want to encourage you this morning. <laughs> Once you're forgiven, God is quick and faithful to forgive. Amen. And I tell you what, don't take offense. God wants to do more miracles in your life. You received that this morning. Amen. Would you all stand? Hallelujah. Praise God.